Uh, hey there, everybody. This is William Morris from that one channel with the logo down there. You can see it, right? It's right over there. Yeah, Brotherhood of Gaming. That one you should be subscribed to. The one whose videos you should be watching because we bust our asses on... This is Bloodstained, Ritual of the Night. I'm William Morris. Welcome to the show. And I'm Eugene Morris. And for those of you who are new to our channel, welcome. Hope you stick around. For those of you who are fans of us or regular watchers, I don't know if we have fans, you probably know that we're big fans of Konami's Castlevania series. From Let's Plays, live streams, and reviews, Castlevania has just been a series that appealed to both of us. With its old-school horror sensibilities, fun platform action, and frustrating as hell knockback deaths. But hey, it's all part of the fun. Another big part of Castlevania history happened in 1997, when the fantastic Castlevania Symphony of the Night was released. This game added more role-playing elements, exploration, and a non-linear approach to the series' traditional platform gameplay. It became such a success both critically and commercially that many future Castlevania games would follow its pattern, such as Hour of Sorrow, Portrait of Ruin, and so on and so forth. The main man behind this was Koji Igarashi, who was the producer on the Castlevania series for almost a decade. But in 2014, Koji grew tired of Konami's internal politics, hey, let's just call it for what it is, guys, bullshit, and finally decided to leave the company for good. Another motivation for him was the large number of requests that he would receive from the Castlevania fans asking for more games from the series. It became pretty obvious that Konami had no interest in continuing with the beloved franchise. Well, at least not in the traditional sense. So, Koji took matters into his own hands and decided to create his own company to fulfill the fans' desires by making an original game with Castlevania Symphony of the Night elements infused in it. He was also motivated by the Kickstarter success of Mighty No. 9. Oh boy, <laughs> hopefully the results turned out better. So with that inspiration, he decided to use a fundraiser to accomplish his goal. Still, it was kind of rough at first, as many would-be publishers ended up turning him down. Unsure if American and European gamers would be interested in this Japanese-based title. Finally, he joined up with Artplay to develop it. And their faith in him was rewarded, as Bloodstained Ritual of the Night reached its base goal within only four hours, making $1.5 million. Wow, that's a lot of money. In addition, other stretch goals were met, such as being able to bring in the legendary David Hayter, you know, freaking Solid Snake, to voice one of the main characters on Getsu. Alu Card's former voice actor, Robert Belgrade, from freaking Symphony of the Night, you know, the deep voice, the one that we love so much. I will not. Yeah, that guy. He's back! Holy sh! And he's playing this other vampire character named Orlock Dracul, who's a librarian. Oh my god! I love it already. Aside from that, he also hired the beloved Japanese artist Ayami Kojima, who brought over her talents from the Castlevania series to do Bloodstain's package artwork. Also coming over from the Castlevania series was composer Michiro Yamane, and it gets better, programmer Shutaro Ida. Christ! So yeah, it's fair to say that with all these familiar faces on board, Koji desired nothing more than to give the fans that same Castlevania experience as much as he legally could. Now last year we got an 8-bit side game called Castlevania Curse of the Moon, which was produced thanks to meeting more stretch goals. And in fact, we have a review of that game right here on this channel. Go watch it, please. Watch our reviews, damn it. We are primarily going to be examining only the Xbox One and PC versions of Bloodstained because those are the ones that we purchased. That's a good word. But be warned, there also is a Nintendo Switch version out there, and unfortunately it is kind of littered at this point in time of the video with graphical hiccups, bugs, framerate issues, input lag, and a whole heap of other problems. So. Full warning, guys, if you guys out there want to buy this game, you might want to avoid the Switch version. They have said that sooner or later they might address all these problems with patches, but for the time being, the game is kind of botched on this console, so you may want to focus on getting it for other systems if you want to play it at all. Now we step into the story of Bloodstained Ritual tonight. Let's first give you guys a heads up for spoilers, so if you want to avoid any of these, you might want to skip forward in the video to the time code right here. Alright? Alright, we're going once, going times. Alright, let's begin. 
With the start of the Industrial Revolution, the secret guild of alchemists were fearing that the people would turn away from them and embrace more material gain. Looking to put the fear of God in the land, the guild summons forth a legion of demons. However, they quickly lost control, and wholesale destruction reigned throughout the land. Don't you just hate it when that happens? You summon a pack of Satan-worshipping demons to help inspire people to believe in God, and then they turn on you. They probably should have looked at the demon's alignment and saw that it was chaotic evil. Oops. The guild then had sacrificed their shardbinders, which are human beings infused with demonic crystals which give them demonic powers, during the summoning. All except two, Jebel and Miriam. Eventually, the church was able to eradicate the demon infestation, but not without great loss. Lost a lot of people in that war. A decade has passed since then, and now Miriam finds herself at war with an army of demons led by her friend Jebel, who has turned on humanity and seeks revenge for what happened to his guild members. He then goes on to construct a castle called Hellhold for his base of operations. Yeah, nice name, dude. Alongside with a young alchemist named Johannes, Miriam travels there to stop Jebel once and for all. Whilst traveling, they meet up with an exorcist named Dominic, who is sent by the church to assist them and elder alchemist named Alfred, who is seeking for a book in Jebel's possession called the Liber Logaeth. To make matters even more complicated, Miriam runs afoul of Zangetsu, a sword-wielding demon hunter, you know, the guy from the last game, who also happens to hate shardbinders as much as demons due to their powers. After being able to win Zangetsu's trust, and I use that term loosely, Miriam confronts Jebel in his castle throne room, and with Zangetsu's sword is able to release Jebel from the demon Grimory's hold. Freed from her control, Jebel apologizes to Miriam before passing away. Putting aside her grief, Miriam pursues Grimory and finds a dying Alfred, who informs her before he passes that Liber Logaith can be used to destroy the Hellhold. Miriam, along with Zangetsu's sacrifice, is able to take down Grimory, and then the true villain of the plot is revealed. Turns out that Dominic was the one responsible. Consumed with a lust for power, she transformed herself into the Shardbinder and used the Liber Logaeth book to summon a great demon named Baal. After a great deal of battle and struggle, Miriam is able to defeat them both, and after the long cursed night, Miriam and her friend Johannes journey on to continue their quest to free the world completely from the demon presence. Wow. You can honestly really feel the fact that this comes off as a spiritual successor to Symphony of the Night. Because there are so many elements that are lifted from that game. Well, as well as other Castlevania properties. Miriam, with her ability to use many weapons and her powers, makes her come off as an update to Order of Ecclesia's main protagonist, Shinoa. Dominic, being an exorcist from the church, does feel a bit like a callback to Saifa Belnades, who was a sorceress sent by the church in her game, Castlevania III. Zangetsu is clearly an homage to an obscure Konami game, Getsu Fumaden, and of course, Jebel is pretty much your Dracula stand-in. But that is just a few examples, as Ritual of the Night is sprinkled with many other cute little callbacks and references. We're not going to reveal them all here, because frankly, we believe that they all really do need to be experienced for yourself. So, the gameplay. <laughs> well, uh, have you played Symphony of the Night? Well, here it, is, here it is again, but uh, we will go into a little more detail than that. Your first level is on a ship. Basically, this is the way the game is going to get you accustomed to what you are about to experience. As Miriam, you will travel back and forth through areas which will be revealed on the map. When you make your way through, be sure to open up the map to keep track of any possible doors that you can go through. Exploration is a big key element in this game, as you will need to search for weapons, materials, armors, accessories, and a whole bunch of other garbage along your way. Your first weapon of choice is your feet, and while they are nice to start with, you are quickly going to need to find better arsenal. Along the way you pick up swords, whips, knives, axe, guns, and many, many other goodies that you'll be able to use. The further you go, the more powerful stuff you'll be able to find. Also, the materials you can find can be used to craft new weapons. In the village just outside the castle, you'll have a hub room where you can purchase items and create new armaments. With Johannes, you can craft materials, enhance shards, which we will talk about later, prepare food that can help raise your stats and health, or dismantle things to get materials back. With Dominique, you can buy things like potions, weapons, and armors, and sell things to get more cash. Also around this area, you'll find village people who survived Jebel's attacks. You can accept jobs for them, such as avenging town folks by killing certain beasts or preparing cuisines for an hungry old lady. Doing so will get you materials and other trinkets that you can use on your adventure. Now as a shard binder, when you defeat enemies that you come across, you can get access to their shards. 
which are demonic crystals that will give you new abilities that you can use in battle. The Conjure Shard allows you to shoot projectiles. The Manipulative Shard gives you assistance such as healing or creating shadows. Directional allows you to use powerful attacks while using the analog stick to send it in different directions. The Passive Shard enhances your abilities such as making your sword swing stronger. And then there's Familiars, which are friends that can assist you in battles such as attacking enemies, healing you, or singing songs while you play the piano. For your equipment, you have your weapon, headgear, body, scarf, and the choice of two accessories. The more you battle enemies, the more points you can receive that will raise your experience, thus raising your level. This will increase your health and magic bar, not to mention finding HP and MP cups throughout the castle. The boss battles that you encounter can be quite epic, if somewhat difficult when you first find them. The basic strategy is to stick and move. Hit them with your attacks and then use your backstep ability to try and avoid the attacks. But chances are that you will be defeated after your first encounter. Now if you're like Will and a total gaming stud, you'll just power right through them. But if you are a mere mortal like me, then you may have to do a U-turn and grind out some more experience. Which is what I believe this game is trying to encourage you to do. As when you leave an area and go right back, the enemies respawn. So you can get stronger, learn some new tactics, and so on and take them out. Now on one hand, this game does not present the same old school challenge from the classic series that many fans of them may enjoy. And this type of game style can get somewhat repetitive. But the key to success in a game like this is presenting you with tons of options that you can search out and use in order to meet the challenges that are laid out before you. This does give the game a ton of replayability. For example, we really feel that no two playthroughs are exactly alike. Each person will have their own way of beating this game, which goes double when you find the stylist that can adjust the look of Miriam 2. Now one thing we do need to stress is that this is indeed a budgeted title, so there are some threads that are hanging off of it. And what we mean is both versions we play do indeed feature some crashing problems, where you might get kicked out of the game. Then there is nothing more annoying than that, so make sure to catch those save rooms whenever you can. Beating the game will unlock several new modes, such as a boss rush and a speed run where you'll try to beat the game as fast as you can. The music, much like the rest of this game, is a beautiful love letter to Castlevania. The tracks are gorgeous to listen to, and here are some selected tracks that we enjoyed. to Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, this is a game that knows what it wants to be and executes it very well. This game is not too worried about current trends. Its only focus is to recreate the love and feeling of Castlevania Symphony of the Night from its graphics, music, sound, and characters. There are some rough edges here and there, at least on the PC and Xbox One versions, but overall it hits the mark. But again, we stress this does not apply to the Nintendo Switch port, and that fact is disappointing. Perhaps it is an example of being a little too ambitious, but hopefully developers can resolve this issue, and quickly, as Nintendo Switch owners deserve the right to play this game as well. For us here at the Brotherhood of Gaming, the game was a delightful treat as it brought up fond memories for us. Fighting the hordes of evil, battling through castles while listening to great music. We certainly hope this game is a success, as we would love to see more entries in the series, as we have greatly enjoyed both offerings so far. Now, do we believe that non-Castlevania fans can get into this game? Well, yeah, we believe so. I mean, once you get used to the gameplay and its tendencies, we do feel that this can be enjoyed by any layman. Or woman. Hey, equal opportunity. The repetitiveness of playing a game like this may take a while to get used to for some people, but with the large variety and addictive action that the game has, it truly can appeal to many gamers out there. So, give it a go. 
Well, there you have it, our review of Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. It definitely delivered the goods. So we do give it a recommendation. Okay, let me just delete his save. Oh, indeed, you've been watching another video from thebrothergaming.com. I'm William Morris. And I am Eugene Morris. And we will see you next time. Hey there, everyone. Did you like this video? If you did, why not give us a thumbs up and maybe leave a comment and watch some more of our stuff? Also, if you really want to keep up with the Brotherhood of Gaming, such as myself, William Morris, or Eugene, you should really follow us on our Twitters. Links provided below, so you can see what's coming up in the future. And since, you know, we have to play these games sometimes and record them, why not join us on our Twitch page where you can hang out with all of us as we do so and chit chat about the games that we love so much. Lastly, if you want to help keep our dreams alive, you can support us any number of ways, either by continuing to view our videos, like them, share them with all your friends and family and your peeps and your girlfriends, or you can also join our small Patreon and throw all your spare cash away. We'll even give you a shout out. Once again, thank you all and have a wonderful day.